This is Kathy Bergen for CN Live, and I'm with Craig Murray, and we're going to talk about the assurances that were just announced for Mr. Julian Assange. Craig, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you and talk to you because you know a great deal about the case and you have already been writing quite a bit about these assurances, what to expect. You alerted us to the ruling in the Supreme Court on June 29th, 2020, from Justice Kavanaugh, that finally, finally made it clear that foreign nationals outside the US territory have no constitutional rights. That includes the First Amendment, but also other rights, such as Article 7, for example, which played some part in the extradition hearing. Can you give us your reaction to what has finally come out? I imagine it's not much different than what you expected. No, um, what eventually came out was exactly what I expected. They've given the assurance on the, the death penalty, which was not hard for them to give because they, they're not seriously looking to execute him. They're looking to keep him locked into solitary confinement for the rest of his life as a dreadful warning to journalists as to what happens if you publish the, the truth about war crimes. But the so-called assurance on his ability to use a freedom of speech defence under the First Amendment um, is fascinating because they've tried to make it look like an assurance. You know, it's disguised as an assurance, but in fact, it's a refusal to give the assurance. What they've said is that he will be allowed to argue in court uh, that he should be entitled to a First Amendment defence, even though he's a foreign national. But of course, they then go on to say it will be you know, entirely up to the judge whether to accept that argument. And we know the judge won't, because as you say, there is a Supreme Court decision that a foreign national acting abroad, a foreign national outside the United States, does not have US constitutional rights. Um, and that's extremely plain. I mean, the, the particular uh, decision was in the case of USAID versus Open Society, um, which was a case about charities and NGOs abroad receiving grants from USAID on condition that they took certain attitudes to sex work and did not say anything contrary to USAID's official policy on sex work. Those NGOs claimed this was in breach of their constitutional right to freedom of speech. Uh, and the US court said that as non-US nationals acting outside the United States, they had no constitutional rights. Now, that may sound like it's not applicable, but in fact, the judgment went on to be extremely specific, yeah. stating that if they were to have constitutional rights, then constitutional rights would have to be given to other foreign nationals acting abroad in other situations with whom the US intelligence services and military had contact. Um, yeah. Uh, and that and as a matter of... Uh, Bay. It includes Julian yes, Assange. As a matter of long-established law... I remember Kavanaugh writing that, that but this isn't new. Um, so it, it is kind of surprising that we're just discovering, we're just getting that answer. Because if you recall in the renewal appeal hearing, um, neither side, uh, and it's just been something that nobody believed Pompeo or Kronberg, um, Judge Barreta, going back to her extradition ruling, argued that once Julian was on US soil, she didn't have to worry about his Article 7 rights because he would be covered by the Fifth Amendment. Uh, likewise for Article 10. And it was, I think, uh, Judge Sharp who said <laughs> sharply, rather sharply, I want a consensus opinion from both sides in writing so that we can knock this thing out, whether he's going to have the rights or not. And then what was discovered after all this time was the 2020 ruling which as you say maybe it wasn't nobody was aware of it because it didn't seem to be a related case but it was very much a first amendment case right yeah um i would say i published it a, <laughs> a few years ago uh that this would happen the 
into that case sh shortly after it happened. I think I actually I actually did publish it on my on my blog as as, as something relevant to the um, Assange case. I'll have to look that out and 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 dig it out. So I was aware of it. Um, I think in the context of Pompeo's comments, I dug it out. Um, it's fairly plain he is not going to be entitled uh, to First Amendment rights because of his nationality. Uh, and it's fairly plain that's what a judge will have to rule in accordance with the uh, Supreme Court ruling. Um, and there are two points to make here, I think. The first point is that it is irrelevant whether or not his freedom of speech argument would succeed, ultimately. Um, the High Court did not say there must be a guarantee that the freedom of speech argument must prevail over the national security argument. That's not what they said. In fact, they couldn't say that because they, their um, uh, stipulation on being able to make the freedom of speech argument was dependent on Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, yeah. which itself is extremely caveated by exceptions, including exceptions for national security. Yes. Um, but what they did say was he must be able to plead it, not yeah. that it must succeed ultimately, but he must be able to plead it, and that pleading it must not be debarred by his nationality. Yes. Um, and what the US government is trying to do is obscure those two arguments or roll them into one. Uh, the, the argument that freedom of speech may be trumped by national security is one argument, and that is something which is a legitimate uh, decision for the courts in the United States in terms of the high court's legal ruling. But the second part, that he must not be stopped from arguing it on grounds of nationality, that is a different thing. And that is the one which would break the European Convention, and that is the one which the High Court stipulates. And in their diplomatic assurance, the United States would try to roll those two things into one, and, and in fact to disguise one as the other. Yes. Um, uh, and so what they're saying is he would be able to seek to argue the point. So he would be able, his lawyers would be able to say, our client wishes to rely upon freedom of speech under the First Amendment, and the judge would rule, no, he can't because he's a foreign national and was acting abroad. And that would have met the assurance. He, he, he's, he's sought to argue, to seek to argue. Um, that's no assurance at all. You know, the, the fact you can ask for a right can be denied it um, on grounds of nationality uh, is not a guarantee you will not be denied on grounds of nationality. So plainly, uh, this assurance falls. It fails to meet the hurdle set by the High Court. Um, yeah. And that's the only logical outcome of this case. But whether it will be the outcome of this case is an entirely different question. Well, um, I think it was... Um, <laughs> um, I've just been looking recently. I think it was point 172. Um, they argue that in the renewal appeal judgment... I believe it's uh, Justice Sharp is saying that Mr. Assange says that the First Amendment is central to his defence. He must be able to plead it. He claims that if he can successfully plead the First Amendment, the case against him will fail. So therefore, it is central to his defence. So I don't see how she can buy a half-baked assurance like that. I mean, I think they weren't very knowledgeable about the case entering into the court, but um, they cottoned on to a few things. There's a few things that, sadly, that they completely missed. And I don't know what you think about it. You said there was a second point to make um, about the assurance. Was was that them both? Um, or Because I was going to talk about the death penalty. I think it's a pretty solid assurance because they also assure that they will not add a death penalty eligible charge on but uh, you know at this argument the point 210 in the ruling where they seem to think that the threat from the cia falls away if he is handed over to the justice system so what they've missed obviously completely blithely unaware of is maureen baird's testimony 
in re-examination, Mark Summers got it out of her. Well, who decides whether a prisoner gets SAMs? Is it the Bureau of Prisons? Is it the prosecutors? No, it's the CIA. So the thing is, he's at their mercy. The connection is the key role that this CIA plays, the controlling role. And remember the caveat that was in the assurance, unless he does something to warrant such measures that ADX promise against taking him there, that also would fall away and that the CIA would finally get to torture him in SAMS under conditions that, you know, in Joel Sickler's statement, there was a warden called Robert Hood who said that it was a fate worse than death, not fit for humanity. I mean, what I can't understand, maybe this is the question that I have to ask you is firstly, uh, how is that not interpreted in terms of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights as cruel and inhumane treatment? And also, do you think that when they go back into court, that they're obviously going to be talking about these two assurances, but can they talk about the other ones that have already passed? Because, of course, that's where this caveat could come up and they could enlighten those two judges about the possibility that Julian is not going into safe hands at all if he's handed over into the prison system. The answer to the last point is, is no, that ship has sailed. You know, they, those arguments are closed off. The arguments about prison conditions in the United States and his state of health uh, were, were disposed of uh, by the High Court in the United States um, appeal where the High Court accepted assurances, and those assurances are not open for the investigation. The, yeah. the uh, defence attempted to argue at the time that they were not adequate, and, and the High Court dismissed it. That That's not up for the appeal. Um, and yes, I mean, it's very plain, but the, uh, uh, the United States has every intention, I'm sure, of keeping him under SAMS and keeping him in conditions of living hell. Um, and at any moment, they can, you know, they can do to him what they did to Epstein. Uh, th th there's no, um, there's no guarantee at all. He won't be, won't be killed. But there's nothing. And I mean, yes, that's, that's obviously appalling and, and and one of the terrible tragedies of this case. But there's nothing legally that can be done about it at this stage within the U UK uh, system. These are points which might be able to be raised if the case gets to the European Court of Human Rights. But within the High Court. Yeah. That avenue is now closed off. Can they not challenge the rationale in point 210 of the judgment? Can't they tell the judges, uh, actually, you've got that wrong. He won't be in safe hands. No, they can't. No, no, but they can only deal with the two points they've been allowed to appeal on, which were very specific. Yeah. They were the, uh, the death penalty assurance, which, which the court will view as fine and, and, and that's closed off on. Yeah. Um, and uh, the question of whether he'd be debarred on the grounds of nationality alone uh, from pleading a, a freedom of speech defence. All the other points were points in which the High Court said you are not allowed to appeal, and that decision is final in, within the UK system. So, so none of those other points can be can, can be raised, and and we are now down to the single point. You know, the, the hearing on the 20 May, the only thing really up for dispute now is the one single point which is left, which is this question of whether he is debarred from pleading the First Amendment on the grounds of nationality. Yes. But obviously it's an extremely strong point because plainly he is debarred uh, from pleading uh, the First Amendment on grounds of nationality. And the only argument the United States have been able to come up with in this very cunningly drafted uh, diplomatic note um, is that, well, he'll be able to argue that he's not debarred uh, on grounds of nationality, knowing that that, that, that will not succeed. Um, whether the British court will accept that, um, it's very hard to tell. I, it's not plain to me, um, and forgive me, but this is something where I'm genuinely ignorant. I actually don't know the answer. Um, I'm not sure it will be Judges Sharp and Johnson again on the 20th of May, or whether it might be two entirely new judges um, who 
uh, I would say are liable to be even less sympathetic. Uh, the, it's not necessarily going back to the same two judges again to determine whether the assurances um, are sufficient. I will need to um, I'll, I'll need to try and check out and see. Possibly, no one knows yet. Um, I need to try and check out whether that's going to be or to be or not. You're right. You would expect Judge Sharp to note <laughs> this does not meet the point that she made. Um, yes. But on the other hand, this is an entirely political case, uh, and at no stage um, have any of the judgments really uh, reflected a fair evaluation of the law. At every single point in this long case, every legal point has been twisted uh, in order uh, to favour the prosecution, and, and I, I just don't see that changing. I, I'm afraid what we're seeing is a kind of charade, a pantomime of process of justice. So I'm I'm just not hopeful. Uh, no, no matter how weak the assurance, how pathetic the, the so-called assurance, which is no assurance, um, I'm not at all hopeful the United States won't succeed. Really? Uh, we've been hopeful before, and <laughs> it's just gone totally wrong. Totally. I mean, I remember John Pilger when the Supreme Court refused the defense's request or Julian's request to challenge the timing of the insurances. And John Pilcher said, well, what was the bloody point of the whole extradition hearing? You know, if they're just going to come in and say, oh, you'll be fine. You know, that ruling just invalidated it all. And um, they never actually overturned the findings of Koppelman and Dealey and, and even um, the other two, uh, Nigel Blackwood, I think his name was, and um, Faisal. So all four of the medical experts were in agreement and they still said it would be all right. Do you think, Craig, um, because you have written about this very important AAA versus Home Secretary, do you think that has changed something? Is that why we're discussing assurances now in court when there was no question of it before? I'm not sure. I, I think the important thing to remember on diplomatic assurances is it has a long history and was an extremely controversial question a long time before the Assange case. Yeah. Um, you know, the UK has accepted diplomatic assurances from Jordan and Egypt that people won't be tortured, who they know damn well are going to be tortured and, and possibly executed. And because we extradite people to all kinds of terrible regimes all around the world, the legal um, the legal fiction has, has been accepted and is established UK law yeah. that diplomatic assurances must be accepted as being in good faith, that the good faith of the party with which the UK has diplomatic relations is taken as granted. And you basically, you know, you get something from the Saudis saying, please give us this guy back and we promise we won't touch him, and you have to accept it. Uh, and that is the established law, uh, that you, you basically are not really able uh, to query these things. Now, that doesn't really apply in the United States case because this isn't this isn't actually the same. It's not the same as, United, as the Saudi saying we won't torture someone um, because this is the United States having been asked to say he needs to be guaranteed he won't be deprived of this right on grounds of nationality, replying, well, he can ask not to be guaranteed. It's not that they're giving an assurance which then they're going to break. It's that they're not actually giving the assurance. Yeah. Um, so it's a different category of thing. So um, I think the um, uh, I think the Assange case um, can be seen against this general uh, extremely strong presumption that diplomatic assurances are always accepted, uh, which is why that um, uh, you know that High Court ruling in the Assange case that they're accepted even when they're completely out of time. Uh, didn't actually surprise me against that background, and 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 um, uh, and I think it's important. We do the problem is people who, like ourselves, who follow the Assange case very very closely, uh, tend sometimes not to see it within the wider position of all the other extradition hearings that are happening. 
often of unfortunate but less famous political dissidents. Uh, and uh, 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 I think that's for context of understanding the desire to accept the assurances. Um, I don't see how, with any pride or logic, the British judiciary can accept this, this non-assurance. But on the other hand, I, I do still very much fear that they will. I, I, I've just completely lost any trust in the system. I'm sorry you have. Oh, uh, so what do you think Mark Summers is going to throw at that on May 20th? I think they will, yeah, they'll, they'll go, it, go go by it logical step by logical step and say this is, this is not an assurance that he will not be deprived on grounds of nationality. Uh, this is merely an assurance that he can argue that he should not be deprived. Um, uh, and the precedents are uh, that he will be deprived. And I think it's very important now. Um, one um, professor of international law I know quite well, Professor Dower Korf, has been, has been in touch um, saying, you know, there are other precedents. It's not just the US aid case, but, but there are plenty of other Supreme Court precedents saying the same thing. Um, right. And you need desperately to get together all those other precedents um, and to get you know, opinions from uh, a bevy of US constitutional law professors that say he will not be given uh, this right. He will be deprived of it on the grounds of nationality. Yeah. Um, the difficulty is I'm not, uh, which is what I would expect Mark Summers to throw at it, um, yeah. uh, you know, proof and, and uh, other cases and evidence. I worry but at this stage, the High Court would refuse to accept any new cases or any new evidence and say, you know, you had your chance to uh, to put that in. But, but the United States, of course, has been allowed to change the charges in the middle of the trial. It's been allowed to it's been allowed to produce assurances months and months after they should have been years after they should have been produced. It's been, but every time the defense has tried to produce any new evidence, it's been ruled ineligible. And my, my guess is that. Almost whatever Mark Summers tries to do, it will be ruled ineligible. That, that, that's my guess for what we're actually going to see. But I expect he's going to try to come at them with a lot of US case law and, and, and perhaps new uh, opinions from distinguished American scholars of constitutional law that say he's not going to be given this right. That, that's what I expect they will now try to throw at the, at the court. But as I say, I, I've just lost all faith in the administration of justice. So, so my expectation is the court will refuse to hear it. I'm wondering if Dobbin is going to be on her own again. <laughs> we might see the return of Lewis. <laughs> you think he's just given it up? Um, you said normally that they, when it's a high profile case, they, they will actually arrange so that the lead lawyer can be there. But uh, there was no sign of him last time, and, and Dobbin didn't seem to lack confidence on her own, I thought. She did seem to lack confidence on her own, and I think that fact contributed, frankly, to the, the comparatively successful outcome for Julian's team. In particular, you know, she was plainly unprepared on this point, on this point of, uh, 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 of nationality, and she... Um, and an ard a lot when she was asked about it by uh, by the judges, um, and perhaps Lewis might have done a better a better job. No, it it is strange that they've um, uh, that the United States has discarded its lead lawyer, and I I just I'm, I'm just there's just no reason there's no it wouldn't be for timetabling because courts do go out of their way to to yeah. fix their diaries with the lead barristers on both sides. Um, so there's more to it than that, but we can we you know we can speculate as to why, but we don't know. Okay, we are well. So we'll just have to cross our fingers. Um, people here in Australia, my goodness, we've got both sides of government. Yeah, I'm, I'm just one uh, supporting. Yes, we want to say something else. Yes. Yeah, just one final point, which is just how horrible this all is for Stella and and the kids and uh, and for John and Gabriel, you know, and obviously for Julian, and it's all part of the long process of mental torture for Julian, but the, um, you know, the effect on the family is just heartbreaking. I know, I know. And I think it does really affect the people, the long haulers, you know, who've been through all of these different periods of hope. Well, this is it, you know, um, and they keep thinking that he's going to be released and then 
oh, it all falls on its face again and it, the years just keep passing. But I'm reminded as well of the case of Mendoza. They were supposed to return him because Spain didn't like separating prisoners from their families. They wouldn't do that. And how long, how many years it took and all the trouble. Um, and what they did to Abu Hamza, um, you know, Lindsay Lewis told us about that. So you can imagine the fear in Stella's heart of what mm. could possibly happen to Julian and, and how, you know, Julian is of the character. It was judged that way, that he's just, he's going to refuse it and, and take what isn't the easy way out, but just end it, you know. But we all, we keep, you know, yeah, go ahead. We keep fighting. You know, we, we we keep on fighting. And it remains the case that Biden is crazy to pursue this in an election year, you know, when he's already losing so much support over his support for the genocide in Gaza. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't any longer believe in the independence of the judiciary. I think that's a myth. Um, and, and I think the judicial process is a sham. And ultimately, whatever the United States government wants to happen will happen. But I, I have not given up hope that the United States government will come to its senses and realize that purely for reasons of self-interest, which is the only thing that motivates these politicians, for reasons of self-interest, alienating uh, the media world and alienating the younger and left-wing and ethnic components of Biden's support by bringing Julian Assange to Washington in chains would be a very, very bad move. So I'm, I'm on, on the grounds that political wisdom may may prevail. I, I haven't given up hope. We, 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 we keep fighting. Well, I think, you know, his name is already mud with what's going on in Gaza. And he seems to have lost control of it as well. He's not looking strong, but the whole business of, of supplying the weapons and and holding out for so long before abstaining. I mean, his name is mud. And if he just dropped the charges on Assange, it might wash some of that mud off. Um, but you're right that it would certainly be a good idea to get the press on side again, to get them a bit more relieved, um, you know, that there's not going to be the New York Times problem. Don't, yeah, isn't that, that's what you're saying, isn't it, really? It, it is indeed. And I think I think they are now there. I think the editorial boards are all now where they should be on that question. Um, and they're not much, there's not much life in it at the moment, because from their point of view, it's all in London, nothing's happening. But were he to arrive in, arrive in Washington, that would change. And there would oh, yeah. actually be, I think, an explosion of negative press comment towards Biden. And so um, I do think, you know, I, I do hope uh, that we will be able on, on political grounds to, to, to get this thing crushed eventually. Um, well, that, but we yes. should talk about Gaza too. Yeah, well, on that note, I'd just like to pass on to, well, the situation that I just brought up and the latest developments. I have a couple of questions here from Joe, who um, couldn't make it uh, to this interview. David Cameron. The foreign secretary is in Israel trying to persuade the Israelis not to escalate following Iran's attack on Israel. Cameron says Israel has decided to react. How do you see this playing out, Craig? Well, I never had any doubt that Israel would decide to re react because Israel, of course, provoked the whole thing in the first place with, with its destruction um, of the Iranian consulate building in uh, in Syria. And Iran had every right in international law to, to respond to that, because that amounts to an attack on Iranian territory. Um, and there's just one, one point I want to make very briefly, which is that uh, almost every single British and American embassy uh, and other diplomatic mission hosts a CIA station or hosts an MI6 station and they nearly all have military personnel in them um, and they also do get involved in obviously in intelligence operations and in military operations um, and in covert operations of all kinds 
uh, including servicing of special forces passing through and that kind of thing. So to pretend that in some way the Iranian mission was different because it does that kind of thing is a nonsense. <laughs> All British and American embassies do that kind of thing too. Uh, that's what happens in diplomatic missions. So if you're going to declare that because um, military or spying activity was being carried out of a, out of a mission, it's okay to destroy it, then you would be saying it's fine to destroy British and American embassies as well. Uh, and plainly, that isn't what they, you know, the position they're taking. But the the idea that in some way this uh, the activity taking place rendered it not a diplomatic mission. Uh, it, it, it's simple nonsense. It's a gross hypocrisy, because yeah. we do it too. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. But this, but this yes. is Go what ahead. Israel wanted to happen. I mean, Israel wanted this yeah. conflict because it detracts from Gaza and it gets all those Western politicians back online saying, see, we told you we need to supply arms to Israel. So of course Israel's not going to drop it. They, they're going to escalate the conflict with Iran to try to drag the United States of America further and further into conflict in the Middle East in order to uh, protect the political position of Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and that's quite simply what's going to happen. So do you think Biden is uh, going to show some spine and make it plain to Netanyahu that he's on his own if he hits Iran, causing Tehran to hit Israel back harder than the first time? No, I mean, plainly not. Uh, he, he's not going to show any spine. And... Um, you know, just as um, probably half or more of the um, uh, missiles and drones aimed at Israel by Iran were shot down by, by the United States of America, not by Israel, um, I think undoubtedly you would find United States military support for any attack on uh, Iran. Um, okay. hmm. uh, that surprises me because I think you had Kirby saying, well, you know, they've got the superb defense, Israel. But uh, it does surprise me. I, I wasn't aware that America shot down a lot of them. So they were helping yeah, um, at that time. But they were actively shooting down. I, I mean, they weren't just um, providing sort of um, logistic support functions, but they were actively involved in shooting yeah. down the missiles and shot down a very significant proportion of them. Right. Um, uh, and I, I think you'll find America will get, get actively involved um, in uh, any Israeli attack on Iran in the same way. Um, Biden is actually showing spine. Um, Biden is pretending to be concerned. The steel spine of Biden is this hardline pro-Israeli hawk who's received over $11 million from the Zionist lobby over the years. Um, and Biden is actually, in a sense, showing an enormous amount of spine in that despite fantastic political damage to himself and despite um, it completely being against the interests of the United States of America and the ordinary <laughs> taxpaying citizen, um, Biden is standing with Israel actively participating in genocide, seeking active conflict with Iran. That is Biden's steel spine. It, it's, a, it's a fascist Zionist spine. And mm -hmm. the, the pretending concern, the pretending he's trying to uh, hold back Netanyahu and pretending he's worried about the genocide, that's all just camouflage. The, the steel fist inside the iron glove, which is the actual Joe Biden, is the guy who strongly approves of the killing of all these Palestinians and who wants conflict with Iran. That, that's the truth of the matter. So um, what's the significance of the retaliation? First of all, it's my understanding that it was legal under Article 51. Um, but what's the significance in terms of the way that Iran chose to retaliate? Um, were they the adults in the room? Um... It's difficult to know how much damage they intended to inflict upon Israel. Um, there are those who believe that Iran knew that an attack on that scale would not successfully penetrate Israeli defences and that they were merely testing out and, and mapping uh, oh, yeah. Israeli defences. That would... To be true, that would mean that the Iranians were pretty certain that the American 
Britons and the Jordanians would, and even the French apparently, would join in right. the active defence against the attack. I don't think the Iranians could be certain of that. Um, I think they probably intended to inflict a bit more damage on Israeli military targets than they did inflict, would be would be my estimation. Right. But I can't claim to know, but nobody who was saying the other thing can, can claim to know <laughs> either. Uh, you'd have to actually have a, a line into the Iranian leadership to, to know, which very few people have. Um, uh, but um, it plainly was not intended to be a mass casualty event Ended at, no ended at civilians. Killed. It was not that. No one got killed. No one got killed. Um, mm. And if there was an intention to kill anyone, it wasn't civilians they were trying to kill, uh, which, which is the big difference between Iran's actions and, and Israel's um, actions. Obviously, a direct attack on, on Israel is perhaps um, a form of retaliation, still legal, but um, because uh, the diplomatic premises attacked by Israel were Iranian territory. It's what a diplomatic premise is. So it, it yeah. as you say, under Article 51 of UN Charter, Iran act legally. It was probably stronger than people expected, yeah. um, uh, but not designed to, you know, to be a, the kind of mass casualty event that's going to lead yeah. to all-out war. Um, and in a sensible world, uh, you would leave it there. But of course, Netanyahu needs conflict. Uh, you know his entire plan depends on on conflict, and and I think we will see further conflict and escalation from Israel. Well, I learned from listening to Scott Ritter that Iran has said that as soon as an attack begins from Israel, uh, off Iran goes as well. Now, after their intelligence gathering operation um, by mapping out the location of anti missile, um, you know where that's deployed from, etc. And the other thing I've learned from him is that they didn't use their biggest missiles, but now that they have a good idea, better idea of how to penetrate the Iron Dome, can we expect that uh, if Israel does attack Iran now, will it be really terrifying what happens to Israel? Um, what's going to happen there? Do you expect casualties then? The next stage is actually um, terrifying because yes. the Iranians do not possess very good defensive capability um, against the Israelis' technologically superior um, air force capability. Right. Um, the Israelis have difficulty getting to Iran. It's a, it's a, a long way away. And mm -hmm. uh, although Jordan's opened its airspace, I don't think Iraq would, um, and Syria wouldn't. Um, but I mean, the... Israelis are able to bomb deep into Syria without any uh, significant um, opposition, aerial opposition. And I think they would be able uh, to bomb Iran uh, without Iran having a significant, sufficiently significant air defense capability. And, and the Soviet systems aren't sufficiently significant. Um, so Israel could inflict major damage on Iran. Oh. Um, Iran does have larger, powerful, very fast um, ballistic weapons, which could inflict significant damage on Israel, which Israel also can't defend. But you're now in a system of of mutually assured destruction, in a sense. I'm, I'm not, not quite to the extent of, of using nuclear weapons and destroying a civilization. But where you have two sides possessing an ability for bombardment, which the other side does not have the ability to counter, uh, and that's where we would be in that scenario. Yeah. Uh, you then face massive destruction because neither side has the ability to defend against the type of uh, heightened attack that either side could carry out. So if the if the Israelis, uh, you know, bomb and, and and provide large destruction of Iran, uh, the Iranians have the ability to retaliate with large destruction of Israel, and, and there we then we are getting into major, major conflict that is going to draw in the United States and is going to draw in other powers. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at World War III. So what we, about Russia? we all what have about, to hope. they come in, Russia? They could do uh, and would almost certainly feel compelled to if the United States did. But on the other hand, um, you know, Russia is is stretched by 
by Ukraine. Uh, okay. Russia's been receiving supplies from Iran <laughs> for, for its forces in Ukraine. Um, and uh, uh, so the you know logistic ability of Russia to come in, or, or what Russia can actually do, Russia, again, can probably only actually come in uh, using weapons of enormous power and 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 and, and destruction, it, it doesn't really have the ability to come in with with feet on the ground, if you like. In fact, everyone's mm -hmm. trying to abolish feet on the ground. So, you know, we could get ourselves into a situation where uh, various powers are pounding and bombarding and bombing and missile striking the Middle East into into destruction. Yeah. Um, and well, we all have to play that scenario as avoided because it's extremely dangerous but it's where the kind of crazed response which i half expect from israel uh in in, in due course is going to go if, if the israelis you know confine themselves to some bombing attacks on hezbollah outposts in syria or something then that's not too different to what happens every day of the week so um so that's not going to bring that kind of massive retaliation, or if they yet again you know, assassinate some more prominent Iranians living abroad, uh, the kind of thing Israel does all the time, that's not going to bring massive retaliation. But if they actually strike at strike at Iran, um, and I think we're moving towards a very scary place indeed. And well, when will they bring out the nukes? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I must say, I am much more sympathetic to have I've supported nuclear disarmament my entire life, including, uh, you know, I've been a member of the campaign of nuclear disarmament my entire adult life since I was about 15, I think, uh, including I support nuclear disarmament by the by the UK and, and by the United States, and unilateral nuclear disarmament, not merely um, multilateral or negotiated disarmament. But I must say, I am understanding now of Iran's desire to acquire nuclear weapons in a way I never have been previously. Uh, you know, I can understand why, if you were the Iranians, you would feel you need nuclear weapons to avoid obliteration. Uh, uh, and uh, so, I don't think the Israelis are crazy enough to deploy it. But, but who knows? I, I mean. Part of the problem of this is you are you are dealing with with people who apparently genuinely believe that they have uh, the imprint of God. They are following God's instructions. And they have a God given right to do things. Um, and when you have people acting with that degree of irrationality, it, it's impossible to rule anything out. Well, I mean, we're just shocked on a daily basis by what they've been doing in, in Gaza. We never thought that possible. Um, you know, the latest one is the, the the clip that I saw. There's a baby, sound of a baby crying somewhere. And when people go to look for the baby, it's just a recording. But when they come out to look for the baby, then they shoot them. I mean, it's almost like a video game now. These people seem to be enjoying this, you know, and it's... It's madness. It's, it's madness. astonishing. The thing that got me the other day was the, the, the new, yet another mass grave discovered at El Shifa Hospital, um, which consisted entirely of patients from the hospital who'd been murdered in their beds, and some some of them still had the saline drips oh. uh, attached uh, to the corpses. Um, yeah. And the, these levels of depravity are, are impossible for normal people to understand. Understand. You know, it's impossible for us to understand the, um, uh, and, you know, they, and they weren't. It's not that they were Hamas fighters receiving treatment. Even that would be would be grossly illegal. Yeah. Um, but you know, the old women lying in bed with drips attached, shot dead, lying in bed um, in the hospital. What what kind of person can do that? The, you know, if it, the, the behaviour of the Israelis, the destruction of all the hospitals, the, the targeting of, of families with children deliberately, as you say, these these strange ploys like getting people, shooting people as they try to get food or shooting people as they try to rescue a baby, the posing with the knickers of murdered women, all, you know, all, all, all this kind of utterly depraved behaviour, I think has, has fortunately, in a sense, changed the worldview of Israel forever. You know, I, I think 
the peoples of the world now fully understand the meaning of Israel, the meaning of Zionism. Um, yeah. It's just we have not yet found a mechanism to control our political class, which has bought and paid for. Uh, the, the situation is desperate. But hey, maybe that's going to change with the party that you have just joined. I, Joe, uh, my colleague, filmed you up in, in Blackburn and I cut it. And uh, actually, I was very, very moved when you spoke about the second day at the ICJ, International Court of Justice, uh, uh, South Africa versus Israel, and all the lies that they told to justify killing children. Um, I mean, it was just incredible. But, you know, one of the hopes that was coming out of, is coming out of that whole, that whole movement now, this explosion of uh, the Workers' Party and all these people defecting, actually defecting from the Labour Party. Um, the notion that the Workers' Party of Britain is um, what the Labour Party started out as, I think it's giving hope to ordinary people who've had it tough up there. I should say the you know the realignment of politics is happening because people are realizing that you know you have uh, Gaza has opened their eyes to a much wider problem. They realize that you have two two political parties, a main party and an opposition party, in England and Wales. Well, England in particular, um, which both support the genocide in Gaza and both do everything to protect the interests of Israel and support continued arms supplies to Israel, even during a genocide. And people just aren't willing to go along with that. And, and it's made them see further that you have two parties that support austerity, that support cutting public expenditure on, on schools and hospitals while increasing it on defence spending, that support not having viable levels of welfare payments and, and old age pensions provided for the British people. Um, and the fact that there is no real choice, there is no democratic choice open to people, has led to this desire for, for new parties and also to a desire for independent socialist candidates. Um, and that's what we've got going in um, in Blackburn. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to give people uh, who voted Labour for generations, and it's got them nowhere. <laughs> They've got nothing from it. Um, uh, a chance to, to to vote for a much more radical prospectus, but, but not only wants us to have an ethical farm policy and stop supporting genocide abroad, uh, but also wants redistribution of wealth. You know, but, but, but doesn't want to have a thousand the thousand wealthiest people in the UK have an average wealth of 750 million pounds. Uh, and it was just in today, in fact, it's just announced in the papers that uh, more than 1 million pensioners are living in poverty. More than 4 million children are living in poverty in, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And a party which stands not, not just for, um, you know, slightly increasing welfare benefits, but actually for policies which are going to stop the channeling of funds into a tiny number of hands, which are going to look to actively redistribute capital, which is looking to renationalize the utilities and the railways and water. Um, you know, a party which bluntly offers a kind of prospectus Jeremy Corbyn was offering when he was uh, leading the Labour Party, um, and even a little more radical than that. I think that's what we want to give people a choice uh, to vote for. And I think we'll break through in some places at this election, hopefully in Blackburn, certainly in, in, in some other places, we will break through. Uh, and in a slightly longer perspective, I, I think this is going to be a fundamental realignment in British politics. Well, I think that the people of Blackburn, they're getting a second chance with you, aren't they? Because you spoke of um, having run there before um, against Jack Straw. And you were the guy that, uh, you know, told the truth about there being no weapons of mass destruction. He called you a liar and they went his way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they get it in a way. You said that there were a lot of people who apologized for voting that way instead of voting for you. They, they realized over time that you were telling the truth and the importance of truth, especially in the face of war and the weapons industry. I remember Julian Assange said that ordinary people don't like war. They have to be fooled into war. 
or they just have to be uh, kept in the dark, um, you know, but the kind of person that you are, you are so transparent and, you know, you've told the truth and I think they're, they're going to feel, a lot of them are going to feel, we've, well, Craig's come back, um, we can do the right thing this time, perhaps. I had a very touching welcome back, um, including from, um, I'm, I was sat on the stage next to Jack Straw's former election agent, for one thing, who was supporting me, <laughs> and, and uh, also received support from the guy who for 12 years was the Labour Lord Mayor of Blackburn and, and head of the Labour administration there. And I was in, I'm standing because I was invited to stand by six local councillors who have left the Labour Party because of Gaza and invited me to come back and stand. Do you agree? George Galloway just said the other day, it quite surprised me that that he was one of the people who thought that a general election might very well be in June. Um, do you expect it to be that early or will it be, in your view, will it be, um, I think it was um, last announced as being sometime in November? What do you think? There's a wide degree of choice. It doesn't have to be until almost this time next year, uh, I think. Um, January, I think. Uh, yeah, my guess is, my, my guess is October, but I don't know. And I don't know what, what information George has that makes him think June. Um, uh, we wait and see, but we'll be ready whenever. We, you know, we we are ready to fight, and uh, we, we'll we'll be at the starting gate immediately. And I, I'm myself going to be moving to live in Blackburn um, as from next month, um, okay. and and be there campaigning full time up till the election. So um, uh, yeah, no, it, it it's going to be. It's actually. Of course, it's a moral duty to stand against two political parties, both of which are billionaire-owned parties, in effect, uh, which take the interests of billionaires and are in full to the interests of Israel. Uh, you know, yeah. it's a moral duty to stand against them, yeah. and that will weigh heavily upon us. But we're also going to have a lot of fun. You know, fighting for the good, fighting for the right, is an enjoyable thing to do, and, and I certainly hope people will be there. Will be there with us. Support it. How's your arm going? Uh, the, uh, I'll let you go soon. But this is the last thing I'd like to know how if it's getting better. <laughs> yeah, no. Are you able to I'll feel to your spuds it is, now. Bluntly, it's very painful. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> it's it's actually um, yeah. I can't really. I haven't got much movement. I can actually. Um, you can't actually see what I'm doing, but I, that's okay. as high as I can lift it. Oh, okay. I've managed to now move my arm forward onto the keypad, so I can now type. I oh, can't. Cool. It, it's this arm. I can't. I can't lift it any higher than it's now lifted, and I can't move it to the side more than that. Yeah. That that's sort of a range of movement in yeah. the shoulder. The um the ligaments are, were all the, the shoulder dislocated very badly. I mean, the it came to there basically, oh. um, and all the ligaments were cut. Um, yeah. so, um, it, it's, and unfortunately, once you reach my age, it takes longer to heal than, you know, it does when you're 30. But if I was 30, it would be a, you know, a six week healing job. Uh, and this is a, um, uh, this is going to be a long, slow process. It, it will heal. It may need an operation. And, and I'm, um, I, I saw myself on that video in Blackburn when I wasn't speaking, and I look extremely miserable. I don't look myself at all. I have this very sort of tight face, and I look angry and upset. It's because it is actually extremely painful all the time. It really is not much fun. Um, but uh, but we'll get through it. We'll get through it. I have to persevere. Well, they make you do physio as well to bring back that mobility. I, I, I had a bit of a fall. <laughs> you know, we're both getting on, Craig. But not that old, not that old yet that we can't, can't be dangerous. Okay, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Very enlightening. Lovely to speak to you, Kathy. Yeah, thank and uh, thank you. Speak soon. Bye. Alexander Makouris was also supposed to join us on this show, but he couldn't make it. However, he sent through a statement which is about the Assange assurances. Alexander says, the court will accept the assurance on the death penalty. That's his first point, and I think that's Craig and I have agreed that there's little doubt about that. 
Secondly, the First Amendment assurance does not say that Assange can rely on the First Amendment protection, merely that he can apply to the U.S. court for First Amendment protection, but that it is for the U.S. court to decide whether or not he can rely on it. Logically, that does not fulfill the terms of the assurance the High Court sought, and this assurance should therefore be rejected, in which case Assange ought to be granted full leave to appeal. I'm afraid I doubt this will happen. On the substantive issues in the appeal, the High Court has sided with Judge Bereitzer. That was the extradition hearing judge. It's such a long time ago, I feel I have to clarify. I suspect what the High Court will say is that it is not its place to ask the US court from its inherent right to determine the applicability of any US law, including the First Amendment. Given that on the substantive issues, the High Court has said that the case to extradite Assange has been made out, I doubt that they will grant leave to appeal because it will fall to the US court to decide at the appropriate time a question of US law. That does not make strict logical sense, but it is the approach I expect the High Court to take. He goes on. If the High Court indicates that this is the direction in which it intends to go, there is one last move which I think Assange's lawyers might want to consider. This is that they could say that since the US assurance is qualified and since a ruling in the US's favour potentially detracts from Assange's rights under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the issue should be referred to the European Court of Human Rights to determine the issue, with execution of Assange's extradition to the US being stayed until the European Court of Human Rights has made its decision. Referrals by the UK courts of cases to the European Court of Human Rights to determine questions which have arisen under the Convention are by no means unprecedented. However, given the inherently political nature of this case, I doubt that this is what the High Court is going to do. So that statement was from Alexander Makouris, he largely agreed with many things Craig Murray said, but he added that other move where <laughs> could we expect that, that the, the UK court actually refers the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Well, Alexander is pessimistic about that, but I think he has learned to be pessimistic with this case because uh, there have been so many disappointments, so many surprises and some outrageous decisions made. Many things where the case should have been cancelled, should have been thrown out of court, spying on the defence, uh, kidnap or kill plot. We all know the story now and are just amazed that this thing has gone on for so long. So it's been a, a long talk with Craig and now a bit of Alexander, but that's it for now from Kathy Vogan for Consortium News. Thank you for joining us. Get out your notebook. More. If you are a consumer of independent news, then the first place you should be going to is Consortium News. And please do try to support them when you can. It doesn't have its articles behind a paywall. It's free for everyone. It's one of the best news sites out there, and it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades. I hope that with the public's continuing support of Consortium News, it will continue for a very long time to come. Thank you so much. <laughs>